Uh, Chris, I have a couple of uh, chairs corner slides. Okay. Uh, it'll just be a moment, so uh, won't interfere significantly with Jenny's. Okay, it uh, looks like uh, people are signing in. Are, are we almost ready to start? Give me maybe a minute or two. Jenny, is that okay? We'll give people just a, a minute or two to switch over from the other one. Absolutely. Okay, well, uh, we're, we're getting there. So let's just get started. I'm gonna share my screen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, do you see my screen? Yes, we do. Uh, just following up on some of the numbers that were presented with QA today. Um, during the COVID pandemic, I was presenting numbers every day, every week uh, related to the hospital. Um, and I've now started to track, I've been tracking neurosurgery numbers system wide um, from the Nader, uh, from just after the Nader. Uh, we were at a normal level in February, and then we dropped down in March and April and May. And so I've been tracking cases on a weekly basis. And um, I want to just share this. Share this. First of all, uh, the endovascular team never dropped that low uh, because uh, you were working around the clock on the emergencies that would come in, the increased number of thromboses initially. Uh, and the strokes that came in. And I'm happy to, sh to see that now uh, you are back to actually greater than baseline. Um, and what we're doing here is uh, comparing this on a weekly basis <clears throat> to the same week in 2019. So you can see the drop, uh, the decrease down in May. Uh, and so that's great, fantastic. Uh, and this is also great. Uh, this represents the OR cases uh, for the health system. And uh, we are really getting there. Uh, we are, we're probably one of the only services uh, across the whole health system to have hit the 70s uh, in May um, and to even hit 100% for, for last week um, in, uh, in June. So let's see what happens to this, but it's a very promising trend and just shows the hard work that you are all doing. Thank you for that. Uh, it's a pleasure to re reintroduce Jenny Zhu, a professor of neurosurgery and neurosciences, director of the Axon Growth and Neuro Neuronal Regeneration Laboratory. Uh, as most of you know, uh, her background and education are nothing short of spectacular. Uh, she seems to have been attracted to the, 
best and the brightest. Uh, for, in talking to Jenny in the past, it sounds like her postdoc with Mark Tessier Levine, who is now the president of Stanford University, uh, was one of the highlights of her of her training. Uh, but since coming to Mount Sinai, she she started with a bang, getting enough data in her first year to submit her R01, which she got uh, based on work and data that she got uh, at Sinai during her very first year of residency. And she's somehow been able to turn the dials up on a large and consistent and high quality surgical practice while at the same time running a major laboratory uh, and with repeated successes in very high impact journals uh, such as her recent Nature Neuroscience a paper that I hope we're gonna hear a little more about today. So Jenny, it's really a pleasure and honor to have you as part of the department. And we look forward to hearing what you're gonna to say to us today. That's about my share. Thank you for the, let me share my screen. Um, Okay, share. Sorry, I'm just trying to do the slideshow. Good. So yeah, so, um, so it is my pleasure to um, give the department an update of the research that's been ongoing in my lab. Um, and uh, this is actually uh, coinciding with the, I, I think it's a new academic year. Um, so we have new crops of residents uh, joining the department. Um, so along the way, I'll share some anecdotes of how I sort of um, uh, choose this field. Uh, how do you address this problem of, you know, axon regeneration? It's a vast, very difficult field. Um, so how do we like, you know, choose the, what fascinates me basically and what drives me? So, um, so before I uh, start, I'd like to actually uh, thank uh, the people who actually did the work, the current members, uh, mostly our postdoctoral fellows, and the past members, who, uh, many of them went to do a very good leading uh, position, positions in various um, research institutes and the funding as well as collaborators. I'll point out to these people as I uh, go along with the, um, today's presentation. So um, as I was preparing for this um, uh, grand rounds, I was sort of sit down and try to figure out what summarize the, the research program. So today I'm really gonna focus on the, um, the one, my main interest, which is the axon regeneration and repair after the injury. And, uh, and uh, for the past few years, I also um, yeah, uh, sort of expanded the research program uh, focusing on these axon guidance molecule in many other CNS disease. Um, so today I wouldn't have time to uh, highlight those, but um, I, actually at the end, I will maybe just a few slides from, uh, for instance, um, for the GBM. Um, so I've been actually looking uh, first with uh, um, Roland Fidel that we uh, share the conversion interest in axon guidance during neural development. Uh, and now we're working together to uh, understand how these axon guidance molecules now are hijacked by the GBM to promote the GBM invasion. Um, and as you know, the, with the Costas, Nadia, Dolores, uh, as well as Praveen, who's a pediatric uh, neuro-oncologist here, we're forming a, a, a monthly um, a research uh, presentation for the, uh, focusing on the GBM. So hopefully we'll uh, cross uh, pollinate each other and uh, come up with um, even more innovative approach, more on the translational level. And uh, on the and uh, there is a very um, uh, 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 sort of intense interest in my in my part to understand what is the tumor quiescence or dormancy. And uh, Julio, who is in the hematology department here, are organizing a uh, also a sort of collaboration, a bigger group that, with many PIs uh, interested in the same field. That we're gonna. Uh, um, work uh, towards this uh, collaboration project. And, and finally, also recently, I've also started to collaborate with Bin uh, Jen, who, is, um, uh, a, a, who leads a huge uh, system, uh, systems biology group, doing a large amount of computation uh, 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 analysis. So he actually contacted me, finding that some of these axon guidance molecule that's dear to my heart is also uh, a one of, turned out to be the hub gene or driver gene in his uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease uh, calculation. 
uh, computation analysis. So we're actually providing the mouse genetics um, to, um, to, 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 to validate uh, his prediction. Okay, so now I'm gonna uh, mostly uh, focusing on my, uh, my long-term interest of in axon regeneration. So um, I guess to this audience, I don't need to really um, elaborate too much on why this is such a challenge, because as we know in the mammalian uh, uh, CNS uh, system, once the axon wiring com is completed during the development, uh, somehow the uh, neurons lose the capacity to regenerate. So that happens to a stroke, you know, a tumor, or any of the CNS disease, disease that we neurosurgeons deal with in spinal cord injury, obviously. So, um, but, so this is the, we call it intrinsic hurdle. So somehow the adult neurons would lose the genetic program that's important to, uh, for the axon growth. So the question is how, what are these players um, and what drives them? Can we somehow reactivate the program? To, um, to get the regeneration. So I will, at the second part, I will, uh, I actually, I started my research as a postdoc in Mark's lab to uh, working on this so-called intrinsic hurdles. And I continue, uh, my lab is currently continue to work on, uh, on the, in, in this direction. Um, but also uh, along the way, many labs, uh, including my lab, also realized that activating neurons is not enough because here's a diagram looking at the, it's just cartoon showing at the injury side, you have all kinds of cells, uh, the, 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 you know, the astrocytes, the immune cell, uh, neutrophil, and they are uh, somehow play uh, very important roles. You have to have um, uh, to address this environment, otherwise the, the, the severed neuron, uh, axons cannot, just cannot pass through this hostile environment. So we're talking about glial scars, myelin, and over the years, many labs have already cloned the molecular identity of these inhibitory molecules associated with myelin, you know, astrocytes. And today I'm also gonna tell you a story about um, that we contributed to the inflammatory cells, which is um, the innate, Im Im innate immune cell. Uh, in this case, it would be microglia, which is the resident uh, myeloid cell in the CNS. But also after injury, you have influx macrophages from the bone marrow. And these two uh, constitute the so-called innate immunity that serves as a first line of defense. But also um, people thought that exaggerated you know, neuroinflammation is bad for the regeneration. So I'll tell you uh, a story that we um, recently pu published. Okay, so, um, and this one is, uh, as uh, 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 Dr. Patterson just mentioned, we're very excited that uh, we made the cover for the Nature Neuroscience in March issue. So this uh, is talking about a, a very new role of microglia macrophages uh, in promoting wound repair after spinal cord injury. So, um, and this is uh, done by a two, um, its co-author from Xian, who is an orthopedic surgeon actually, uh, finishing his MD PhD program. So he spent in China, he spent two years in my lab uh, and did this uh, fantastic project together with uh, Shilaka, who is a postdoctoral fellow. <clears throat> so we actually commissioned uh, an artist in, uh, in his, in, in Xian's uh, institute to make this uh, uh, cartoon for us and it was <coughs> selected as uh, the, the cover. So, um, so if you think about uh, macrophage microglia, all you can think first is, oh, they're, in, they're inflammation, right? So all you know is cytokine, people actually talked about uh, M1, M2, so meaning the good and bad cytokines. <clears throat> but uh, other than that, uh, you actually kind of draw a bl black box. What do they really do? I mean, they may be clear debris, they incite a lot of inflammation. So it's actually really hard to know what else are, are, are they doing. So, uh, so I started in this uh, field because um, Otomo, um, who's an assistant professor in Japan, who um, spent a, a sabbatical year in my lab, uh, he wanted to study uh, epigenetics um, in uh, you know, spinal cord injury. Because uh, my lab actually later on, I'll show you uh, um, that we did some pioneering work in the epigenetics uh, regulation of the axon regeneration. So when Otomo, uh, he had a background of neuroinflammation. So he asked me whether he can just look at the injury site rather than look at the neuron. So, um, so I said, sure, let's take a look at the, uh, a, a family called uh, histone deacetylation. It's a huge family, actually eight members. So I said, let's just see whether they're upregulated or downregulated at the injury site. And sure enough, uh, Tomo showed uh, by immunohistochemistry 
And here is the spinal cord, a sagittal view, so dorsal ventral rostral caudal view, sagittal cut. <clears throat> and he shows that the HDAC3, uh, which is an enzyme that uh, later on I'll show you that it changes the histone uh, codes. And you can see an upregulation after injury. And then when he uh, looked deeper, he found that these cells that upregulate HDAC3 are turned out to be immune cell labeled by CD11B, which is a myeloid marker. So you can see all the red cells expressing this. HDAC3 is a, is a histone a modifier. It's a nuclear protein. So these are nucleus. Uh, and then uh, so Tomo, what Tomo did is he uh, found uh, an inhibitor that can specifically target HDAC3 that actually also has CNS penetrance. So when he applied the drug uh, to inhibit the HDAC3 activity, he shows by uh, the BMS score after spinal cord injury, there is an improvement of the, uh, the mice. And uh, when you do the uh, look at the, the tissue itself, you can see uh, the greens are labeled with the uh, neurofilament H, which are axon uh, uh, markers. You can see there are a lot of axons that are able to traverse the lesion core. So, uh, and uh, at the time, um, of course, there are many, I'm just highlighting the, the main, main uh, points. Uh, we think, here's a model, we think the HDAC3 uh, is somehow controlling the gene program from a differentiation from a homeostatic microglia macrophages to towards inflammatory or M1. People thought these are the bad one. So when you have applied inhibitor, you can actually switch this uh, differentiation towards a pro-repair or a better or M2 uh, phenotype. And uh, indeed, when we've profiled the, the area, we indeed find a global, the, the greens are the application with the drug, global immunosuppression at this injury site. So this is just a general view, and that sort of piqued my interest. It was, it was just a little side project in the lab. And then subsequently, I wonder, I kind of really like these cells because I think they're doing the very active, these macrophage microglia. The question is, uh, what else besides these inflammation are they doing? So to approach this problem, uh, let me play a video. And of course, along the same parallel, we have many other um, projects that going, on, going on that sort of led me to, uh, to this view. So first of all, this is uh, what corralling means. So uh, my post actually found this on the uh, YouTube, I guess. Um, so you can see, uh, imagine each sheep is a cell, okay? And this pasture land is um, the battleground at the injury site. So if you look at each, uh, each cell, uh, this is really depicting what's happening at the injury site. You have so many different cells and individually they're very chaotic movement. They're just randomly moving, but as collectively you can kind of see they're being corralled and there is a purpose there. So the question is, um, how do these glial cells, each sheep is a cell, how are they sensing the environment, um, you know, they integrate these cues and these cues are usually growth factors or chemokines that tell them to move. But so what are these signals? And if you think about it, the cells are colliding with each other all the time. And so what controls this cell collision behavior? So when the cell collide with each other, what do they do? Do they stuck, just stuck with each other, don't move or they repel? and then they re -guise. So it, it's kind of like a guidance, but instead of axon guidance, so it's actually, we call it cell collision guidance. Um, now, I didn't invent the, the term, it's actually a very active term in the some emerging field. And also the other thing is, uh, if you uh, keep looking, uh, eventually at the, at the injury site, you want the wound to compact down, right? You want the wound to be as small as possible um, so that, so that the, the, the nearby area can regenerate. So that sort of fascinates me of what really controls these guidance, what guides them, and what control, like they're contracting down, like, like this one. So what really, um, how, how do you, you know, what, what are the molecules? Okay, so to address this, we have to like uh, step back a little bit to, um, instead of taking a candidate approach, like what we did for the HDAC, we want to ask an open question. What are the genetic uh, gene signatures for the in these uh, activated microglia macrophages? So to do so, uh, you have to label these cells with this fluorescence so that we can isolate only the, we don't want to grind the whole tissue up. That's what the historical approach, that's just too messy. So we actually want to only isolate the microglia macrophage and then compare with and without injury. So to do so, um, the uh, apparently microglia is very finicky because the microglia reacts to any injury within minutes. So the historical way, a conventional way using fact sorting, so fluorescent sorting to, 
to get these cells out from a tissue takes hours. So by, by the time you actually get these uh, fact sorted microglia macrophage and do RNA sequencing, you're actually already looking at artifact. So uh, to circumvent the problem, so a number of years ago, uh, Shilaka joined the lab as a postdoc. Uh, so I told her that we should probably use this uh, um, a pretty new, uh, something called Intact. It's a uh, uh, reporter mice that uh, allows you to label all the, um, uh, the, the cells of interest, in our case, myeloid cell, with a, a nuclear protein called SUN1 that's tagged with GFP. So now you can imagine all the, so here we crossed with a special Cree line, which is called CX3CR1 Cree ER, which I'll use that later on. This to target specifically with the tamoxifen induce, inducible. So you can, you can control the time and also what cell type. In this case, we all the myeloid cell in the green. So all the cells in the nuclear will be labeled as GFP. So then you can uh, you know, snap freeze the tissue and get these green cells out and then do sequencing. So this is what actually took a number of years to really, uh, we just submitted a paper uh, with the subsequent, I'll tell you some single cell level analysis. So here, this is quality control. Indeed, all the green cells are expressing only the microglia macrophage marker, but not the other markers. So when we did the RNA sequencing, uh, now we actually compare the three time points, uh, three day, seven day, 14 day, and ask what kind of genes are we, are we looking at? So here's the prin uh, principal analysis. We did a triplicate for each uh, time points. Of course, they had to aggregate closer to each other than to other, indicating high quality, da high quality data. And then we did uh, with the Bing uh, computational group, we did, uh, did a hierarchical clustering, looking at the whole genome of, of all the gene patterns. So here's each line is a gene. So you can look at different time points. You can see this cluster one genes. Uh, each line is a gene, as I said they're upregulated at day three. And if you look at what are these genes, uh, you do a gene ontology enrichment analysis, it'll show you all these genes are related to cell cycle and some cytoskeleton, maybe it's like cell movement. Uh, and uh, so that indicates uh, at the very early on, these microglia macrophage need to control the genes uh, to uh, proliferate and migrate. And uh, cluster two and so on and so forth. Cluster two, for instance, is very interesting. It's downregulated uh, early on. And these are the, um, the genes that controls the ribosome, which is the uh, RNA making new genes, and spliceosome. Uh, I'll, I'll briefly mention that we found there's a lot of alternative splicing in these uh, active, activated cells. Okay, and then there's also cluster three and cluster four genes. Okay, so then um, this is just briefly, it's a, uh, we obviously did a lot more um, uh, analysis. This is just the looking at the intersecting the three time points that isolated, we call it a core, um, kind of like this catchy name called injury activated myeloid cell that includes microglia macrophages. So 131 cells representing this core program. And these cells, uh, these genes are uh, enriched for multiple of uh, these sort of immune related genes such as uh, uh, the CD11C here, scavenging. So they are phagocytosis and also lipid metabolism such as APOE, it's a very famous gene for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and also lipid uh, protein, and also tissue repair. They also have a lot of matrix-related um, pro uh, protein to reorganize the matrix. And what's interesting is that we notice a lot of genes are very famous uh, in the something called DAM. It's called disease-associated microglia. So a lot of people do these single cell sequencing or like what we did uh, uh, profiling these genes and found uh, these so-called DAM signature. And when we did overlapping, and these are the core uh, genes. So they do share some genes. And if we look at a broader, uh, all the CNS um, disorders, not just the Alzheimer, but also even brain irradiation, aging, chronic pain, neuropathic pain, or ALS. So that's a mouse model for that. So you can see uh, this is a circus plot showing that there is uh, quite some overlap, indicating at different disease, uh, there are some uh, core genes that are shared, but of course, there are also distinct um, signature. Okay, so when we looked at uh, different time points, we asked, okay, so the core, we understand what is the different time point. So as I mentioned, indeed, at day three, uh, most genes are enriched for cell cycle control. At day seven, um, actually very interesting, there is uh, iron channel. So the calcium channel, sodium channel, a lot of these channels genes are mostly downregulated. And at day 14, as expected, there are a lot of matrix protein enrichment. So here's just a, a sort of summarized, um, these uh, progressive activation of the program. So now we have a handle of uh, all the genes, and now I'm gonna tell you a story what is 
the axon guidance here because it just uh, came up in our in our enrichment in the seven day, which I didn't show here. The axon guidance molecule are mostly uh, are enriched in, in at, at the day seven. So uh, since I have a long uh, background, a long term interest in the axon guidance, and I did a postdoc with Marcus Levine, who cloned the very first axon guidance molecule called Metrin back in 1994. That was actually one of the, re the reason that I wanted to do a postdoc with him because it was such a seminal paper. Um, okay, so then, um, so I said, okay, let's take a look uh, at the uh, a big class of axon guidance then because it's uh, showed up in our uh, gene uh, signature. So here's, as you can see now, it's getting the devils are in the detail. It's a very, very complex, complex, uh, huge family. So this is just looking at one family of the axon guidance molecule called semaphorin and plexin. And today I'm really going to talk about plexin B2 because it is the most highly upregulated gene and most highly abundant gene in the IM. Okay, and the semaf there is a semaf a plexin is a receptor. The ligand is called semaphorin. And you can see it's a huge family, semaphorin three, four, five, six, seven. So the semaphore is the cog cognate ligand for the receptor. And if you look at it uh, in matching, right, the, the semaphore is the highest the ligand expressed in these uh, immune cells. So the question is, you know, what are these axon guidance molecules doing in the, in the immune, in the innate immunity? Because they're axon guidance molecule. So and turn out to be uh, actually the last several years, um, people actually are looking at these, they, they're called immune um, semaphorins because they somehow uh, modulate uh, the, the T cell activation and many of these uh, micro, uh, the macrophage activation. So, but nobody has uh, studied what, what they're doing in the CNS injury. So just a, a brief background uh, to tell you what is plexin B2, because that's the subsequent, uh, the paper I'm gonna talk about is mostly plexin B2. So the plexin B2 actually, um, so initially was studied by Roland uh, when he was a postdoc, he made the first knockout and uh, showing that deleting uh, plexin B2 uh, causes uh, neural tube closure defect. So you have the, the here's a neural tube, it's actually, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it wasn't able to close. So, um, and also he found that uh, here's a cerebellum, uh, the blue cells are marked, uh, are, is, a, is a reporter for the cell that express plexin B2. So these cells obviously express a lot of plexin B2. If you don't have plexin B2, you can see these dots on the surface so there's a decoupling of the migration and, uh, and, and proliferation. So this just uh, shows that there, it controls um, uh, you know, neurodevelopment, but, it's, uh, but that was just a description of the phenotype. It's very hard to understand what is plexin really doing to control these vastly different processes. And if you look at the plexin, and here's just a, you have to see that what is the molecule doing to really understand what, why we clone, you know, deleting the gene. So the plexin, as I said, it's a receptor. It sits on the cell membrane. It, it has a very uh, conserved uh, domains. Um, on, on the extracellularly, it actually has a summer domain. And this domain allows it to bind to the semaphorin, which is a ligand. And intracellularly, uh, these are the gap, the gap domain, VTDL. Those are the domains that controls uh, small GTPAs. Um, I hope some of you guys still remember from the, uh, the, the college, right, the small GTPAs exchange GTP to GDP. Uh, then in this case, we think the downstream is RAP that can subsequently control uh, a network of fibronectin cytoskeleton that allows the cell to move. So this is just a general idea um, and turned out to be, we just published a paper last year, uh, Christian, a postdoc in the lab has an interesting evolution. So he, um, he and Roland actually mostly did a uh, uh, follow uh, uh, genetic analysis uh, looking at the evolution of plexin. When do plexins start to emerge? Because we thought it's an axon guidance molecule probably emerged uh, once the CNS, uh, the nervous system emerged, but that's not true at all. The plexins and semaphorins are very ancient molecule. You can see that you can identify plexin sema in the single cell uh, before even multicellular organism in the uh, chylophlagellate, uh, for instance, and all the way to human. And there, this, this shows the evolution. We collaborated with evolution biologists to map out uh, how the summer and um, semaphorin and plexin gain each domain. And here is a tree that shows the semaphorin and plexin. And today I'm going to talk about plexin B1, which is right, B2 actually, it's right here. So you can see 
how difficult the, the, the whole field is on so many molecules. So with this uh, uh, evolution picture, so we think, oh, that's plexin is regulating the cytoskeleton, the cell adhesion that predates the before the emergence of the CNS system. So, but what is it doing then? So today I'm just to give you a background. This actually really influenced our thinking. So Christian went on, we have a revision uh, going on right now. Uh, he did a very talented work, uh, totally not my, uh, outside my expertise, but we did some collaboration. So he actually showed the, if you uh, in the human ES cells, so now we're going all the way back to um, the development, right? The hu human embryonic stem cell. Um, and he grew, the, grew these all the way to a, a mini brain, a 3D mini brain from to, uh, through the uh, uh, neural progenitor cell step. So, and during this process, he found um, that when he overexpressed plexin B2, he can change this uh, colony. This is just a group of uh, human ES cell. The colony looks somehow different than the control. Here's a knockout. Actually, I'm not showing the, uh, the overexpression. So um, of course, through many, um, uh, almost two years of work, uh, we somehow settled on well, what is plexin doing is it controls the stiffness of the cell. Um, and here's atomic force uh, microscopy that can allow you to directly measure how stiff the tissue is. So when he uh, did that, you can see it's extremely stiff when you overexpress plexin B2. And when you knock it down, it's become softer. And here's some quantification. And then, uh, so then this is cell mechanics that's controlled by an axon guidance molecule. And that actually, of course, later on, we show that has something to, uh, that, that affects the proliferation, migration, and many things that we talk about. So when he, um, when he grew these um, from a 2D to 3D, you can see usually cells like to aggregate into sphere, that's wild type. But when you uh, remove the plexin, cells become really floppy. So they couldn't really contract down. You can see that become a very irregularly shaped, but huge uh, 3D um, embryo body, it's called. Uh, and, uh, and you can rescue that by, over, by expressing plexin back. And when you overexpress plexin B2, their contractile probability is out of the roof and they become tiny, tiny organoids. Um, so, uh, so that's, um, with that in mind, uh, we started to look at could, the, could it be that the plexin is controlling the cell-cell movement, contractile probability of the innate immunity, which is a totally new field. So, um, and here is um, presenting some data um, of how we arrived at this conclusion. So um, here's a summary. We basically uh, uh, did the spinal cord injury. Uh, we found that the plexin B2 indeed controls this corralling process. Uh, it, uh, why corralling is important, as I mentioned earlier, it limits the necrotic core in the center. Uh, it limits the infl inflammatory spread. It uh, really helps the organization of the ECM. And the mechanistically, how it does so, it, it controls something called cell collision or cell inhib contact inhibition of locomotion, or CIL. That's actually a term that's used uh, for the field. Okay, so, um, so how do we do that? First, um, uh, to, to, to understand what is plexin B2 doing, we just did a, um, uh, make a knockout. Uh, we, we made a, a conditional knockout at introducing a flux allele here. Uh, and also we had a, a, the second allele would be a complete knockout introducing a LAC-C reporter so that we, we know where, which cell express lac -C. So you can see again, after spinal cord injury, you have uh, induction of plexin B2 reflected by the lac -C staining. And here's immunohistochemistry, red is plexin B2 huge induction, continue on all the way at 14 and subsequently waned at day 21. And uh, here's indeed showing that these cells are indeed uh, immune cell uh, reflected by uh, collab uh, overlapping with IGO-1. We were able to delete the gene by uh, crossing the same uh, CX3CR1 Cre-ER. As I mentioned, you can introduce tamoxifen and at precise time point, you can delete the gene. And uh, here's just showing that normally in the control, you see a uh, red signal of plexin B2. After deletion, uh, you can delete the gene. So, so before we actually do the spinal cord injury, we ask um, is, uh, can adult microglia survive without plexin B2? So here we first did the confocal, it looks okay. The cells are there, they didn't, um, the, the rest cells are using TMEM119, it's a microglia specific marker, uh, it looks fine. But when we did the um, high super resolution um, microscopy, so this is just a recent uh, development with the Nobel Prize winning for this uh, technology, we're able to see uh, there is a less uh, motile 
uh, processes, uh, less you know, elaborate processes as compared to control. So um, what's interesting about microglia is uh, they're very, very dynamic. So they literally extend all these processes um, like, like a squid almost, like they just touch the environment. And, uh, and that requires, as you can imagine, a lot of cytoskeleton coordination. So, so we obviously hear um, the, the plexin B2 is important for that. If you don't have plexin B2, they don't um, elaborate as much of a processes as, as in the control. Okay, so here, this is what Xiang did. Uh, so he said, okay, let's do the spinal cord injury now. So he, we settled on a, we, we, we have a contusion, a computer, a contusion model, basically a computer controlled drop a, a controlled weight to, uh, usually we do a T8 uh, laminectomy, then you drop the weight on, you get a contusion. So there is no breach of BBB uh, or dura. And so it's more mimicking the clinical scenario. So in this case, we then started to add tamoxifen to delete the gene. We had to, um, we decided to delete the gene early and minus three before the spinal cord injury to delete the gene in all the microglia. And then we then continue to add the tamoxifen to delete the gene in all the influxed macrophages. So macrophage actually uh, is coming from the monocyte and the, the, injury, the, the stem cell in the bone marrow that they do not express this CX3 cell. So you have to continue to add the tamoxifen to delete the gene. And, and, um, and immediately we saw a, a huge uh, difference. So the, the knockout without plexin B2, they don't fare nearly as well as the control cohort. Um, and um, we also did a, additional uh, motor and sensory um, uh, a battery of uh, behavior testing all showed the blue cohort, the condition knockout is not doing well. So this is the first indication that plexin B2 uh, is actually important for regeneration. Um, okay, so, and here's actually a video that just give you a flavor of how we do these experiments. So usually here's the three week after the contusion injury. In the control, we did a moderate contusion model so that um, the, in the wild type, they recover quite nicely after T8 contusion. But you can see in the conditional knockout, they're still dragging the, the, hind, uh, the hind limbs that you can uh, using this score system to quantify them. So this is really a, a black and white uh, um, um, phenotype. So we're really excited. Now the question, the next question is uh, what's going on in the spinal cord? Why there's uh, no regeneration? So here, um, because we delete this gene, remember only in the immune cell. So uh, first we take a look at these, um, uh, the spinal cord. Here's again, sagittal view. Uh, you can see uh, after control, uh, five weeks of recovery, this is corralling what we're talking about. The wound is very small now, and you can see the axon fibers are trying to reconnect uh, um, in, the, in the nearby uh, areas. But in the knockout, the, uh, the wound, um, the CSPG labels the, the astral scar, it's huge. <clears throat> there is no corralling, there is no compact, there is no uh, 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 contract, contraction of the wound. Uh, and uh, at these other, uh, there is no axon able to regenerate uh, reconnect, I should say, uh, across this uh, lesion site. And uh, since we're uh, now we're looking at more at the IBO1 cell, these are the immune cell. So you can see, and here's the corralling that's very definitive. So at uh, 35 days, the, uh, the, the necrotic core and the immune cells are uh, stuck in the middle and they're surrounded by a thin rim of GFAP, which is the astrocyte. So the rest cells are astrocyte. They're confining these uh, debris and, and immune cell in the middle, allowing the, the area, the nearby area to recover. But in the knockout, when you don't have plexin B2 in the immune cell only, the, uh, the, there is a huge uh, spillover of inflammation, inflammatory cells. And there is no, they're trying, but there is no such a black and white corralling happening. So this is the first uh, indication that the cell cell sorting or when they collide with each other, they're not able to sort into this kind of, you know, uh, green and red zone, basically, if you will. Um, and we, of course, did additional marker here. So looking at the, um, the matrix, you can see the, uh, the, the ECMs are uh, organizing in the control setting, but in the null count, they're spilled over. There is, they just couldn't get the, the wound small enough. So here's all these SPP1 is the matrix mark, uh, protein. You can see it's resolved here but huge spillover in the, in the control. And there's some additional markers that we're not going to. And now we also looked at more closely at the, uh, the phagocytosis. So here um, using oil red, uh, oh, it's a staining for the lipid debris. You can see in control, it's just confined in the middle. The nearby areas are subsided, the injury is subsided. 
but in the Naka, it's still just uh, the whole area is not, there's, there's no evidence of injury resolution. The CD68 cell labels are the phagocytic, um, it's a phagocytic marker uh, marking these cells here. It's subsiding, but not in the control, in not, sorry, not in the knockout where there is just, here's a lesion center, but even you know, mili, uh, micro, microns of, apart, they're still just uh, extremely active. And of course, we also can measure the actual uh, cytokine level showing that uh, huge uh, global um, uh, inflammation increase in the knockout mice. Okay, so the so I'm gonna wrap up this soon. So the D is cleared, and uh, now you're gonna try to corral together. And that's actually not true when we looked at a different time point. As even just a week after the injury, you can see that it's already this very nice donut shape already in the in the center is a cell poor and aquatic area surrounded by the immune cell and surrounded by the uh, the, the astrocyte. <clears throat> so it's it happened extremely early. Uh, and what's interesting is it also it also guided the angiogenesis. So um, the the directionality of the angiogenesis is usually like this kind of kind of like a donut shaped um, a circumferential thing, and that's totally disrupted when you don't have corralling, when you don't don't have guidance basically. Um, <clears throat> and uh, again, you can show the resolution of the uh, the CD11 CD31, which is PCAM showing the vasculature, it's uh, injury uh, capillary regressed in the control, but uh, <clears throat> continued uh, engorgement of these capillary indicating the uh, failure of injury resolution. Okay, so <clears throat> the next question is, uh, okay, it seems like the plexin B2 is important during the early time point. So can we experimentally prove? So the way to do that is um, we took advantage of the tamoxifen inducible uh, uh, deletion of gene, so we can control when do you want to delete the gene. So if we delete the gene during the first three weeks and let the final two weeks recover, you can see no, uh, still no, no good, in, no good recovery, indicating it's important. Then we push even earlier. What about the first, just deleting the gene for the first two weeks, and then the last three weeks, uh, plexin B2 will be allowed to re to re uh, express. Still not good, although there is slightly better than the than the, the, the green curves. Okay, so this, um, and now reverse. If you um, uh, delete the gene early on, um, uh, uh, oh, sorry, the other way around. So if you delete the gene only later, for the first week, you allow just only one week, seven days, you allow plexin B2 to express. Is that good enough? And, and that's actually showing it's, um, it's just totally fine. So this really indicates that the knockout at a later time point, it doesn't matter. It's the first seven days that's extremely important. Okay, so then, um, so now mechanistically, how does it really work? Um, so we of course did a lot of experiments showing that the recruitment um, to the, the, of these immune cells are totally fine. They're able to phagocytose if you just give them opportunity. So these are fluorescent labeled beads. That each of the beads are eaten, eaten up by the cell. So that's, there's no difference between knockout and control. And all the markers, uh, the APOE that I mentioned, uh, it, uh, these are the marker for the activation, no, no problem. So the plexin is not really required for this kind of basic uh, inflammation or phagocytosis related function. So what plexin is really doing is, so when we looked at these uh, cell dispersion, so we found that the, the, in the knockout, the, 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 the immune cells arrived at the injury site, but they just kind of cluster in the middle uh, they don't. They can't really disperse uh, nicely as in the control. Uh, and uh, when we do the video, uh, we actually shoot a video of the looking at these cell culture. They they move a lot less, so so the motility is compromised. And this is actually the most telling experiment. So this is called something called contact inhibition of locomotion. So the way you do it is you do the cell culture. The green cells are the immune cells, the microglia. And uh, in the control, you can see when the green cell approach uh, these other cells. It's contact five minutes, and then in the next ten minutes they move away. So here's another example. Uh, this one they contact, make contact, and then a few minutes later they move away. And that doesn't happen when you don't have plexin B2. So when you we you know knock out, they approach, and then 35 minutes even they're still stuck together. So um, and here's um, <clears throat> you let the culture grow a little bit longer. So that's actually a video. Uh, here we just uh, uh, a few days later take a look in the control you see the two the two um, green and red cells are segregating from each other and that doesn't happen when you don't have plexin. So here's a basically a model what is contact CIL means when the two cells collide plexin allows them to move away. 
And then if you re repeatedly doing so, that's how the corralling happens. Uh, and of course, uh, finally, uh, you also notice that the, uh, the density is much reduced uh, in the, in the uh, knockout. That's because the contractility, uh, as I mentioned, just remember that human yes cell experiment, we showed that the cells are stiffer, contractile property is reduced in the knockout. All right, so, um, so I'm gonna skip a little, some other experiments. So here's just a quick um, a summary of what I just told you about the, the corralling. Uh, so hopefully you get away from this is uh, when you think about the inflammation, microglia, it's not just cytokine, they also physically guide different cell collision so that they can form this kind of small wound. Uh, and along the way, um, the ECM is uh, reorganized and uh, inflammation is retained, is uh, restricted. Okay, so now I'll move on to some of the new uh, data, uh, just a few slides. Um, so now we just, um, after we completed that project, we wanted to understand uh, even uh, at, a, at a cell single cell level, what's going on. So the way we do is you, you can do now single cell sequencing. Each cell can, you can have a, a transcriptome. So we sequenced, um, we compared the, uh, the control, a spinal cord injury, uh, and in this case, remember I mentioned HDAC3, so we wanted to then add the HDAC3 inhibitor. Uh, so we have these uh, three uh, mice uh, sequenced a total of, um, this is after quality control, we actually sequenced a lot more cell. Uh, these cells pass the quality control, so a total of about 9,900 cells. Uh, and uh, so this is how you do, you do the principal uh, component analysis. These are called clouds. So this is in the adult, this is really the first time looking at these uh, cell and cell components in the adult spinal cord. So you can see the biggest one, it's the total of uh, nine clusters uh, or nine clouds identified. Each dot is one cell. So this is organized according to their transcriptional signature. So the largest cloud is oligodendrocyte. The second one is myeloid. And actually you can already see there are two clouds. This is a macrophage and this is microglia. So they actually really maintain their uh, distinct uh, identity. And then followed by endothelial cell, a lot of angiogenesis at the injury, and uh, astrocyte, neuron, you know, oligo, OPC, neutrophil, even pericyte. So here is different color. You can see the different condition. The bruise are uh, homeostatic state. And after injury and after the uh, injury with the HDAC3 inhibitor, you can see, and here's a heat map showing that the myeloid cells are expanded, oligos are, contra are contracted, and so was neurons, astrocyte, endothelial cell emerge. So, um, and of course, I wouldn't have detail to tell you more, but just to show you that the, within the microglia, so earlier I told you about plexin be important for microglia. It's as if microglia is a one population, and that's totally not true. On the single cell level, so again, each dot is a cell, you can subcluster microglia into four clusters. So, uh, you know, one, two, three, four, and here is a composition. One is the biggest one, uh, followed by actually three, four in the control. And you can see after spinal cord injury, they expanded, one, two expanded, three and four actually contracted. Um, and uh, so what are these different microglia doing? So we assigned the special molecular signature and the tasks for them. And it, uh, based on their signature, it, it's very interesting. So the MG1, we call it microglia one, is uh, immune related function. So they're expressing a lot of interleukin, a lot of the cytokine, and, they, and here's the pathway, the TNF, uh, NF, kappa B, those are the classic immune uh, pathway. And MG2, that's the one that greatly expanded after spinal cord injury. And guess what they're doing? They're doing autophagy or um, phagocytosis, and they use a taro BP network, which is the Alzheimer's disease network. Um, MG3, that's the small one, is uh, they, they're marked by, uh, it's called uh, immediate early genes, FOS, June, these are the classic, uh, uh, classic immediate early genes. So indicating this is a reactive um, uh, group and uh, MG4, uh, it's actually proliferation. Uh, uh, so what's interesting is HDAC3 that I mentioned actually is uh, preferentially expressed in MG4. And here is a, we do a trajectory to see the microglia um, transformation by based on single cell slingshot, it's called. So it mapped, basically the program tells us that the microglia starts with the MG3, which is very uh, fitting, right? It's immediate early response and transitioning to microglia one, two, and then eventually four. But when you apply the HDAC inhibitor, uh, then you're reversing the trajectory from four. And imagine, uh, remember I said uh, the HDAC3 is 
expressed in MG4. So all of these are uh, very interesting and also same is for the macro macrophages also have four clusters and they uh, take up different tasks. Um, okay, so this is actually very exciting and uh, uh, and remember I mentioned the IM and DAM, that's Alzheimer's disease, uh, they share uh, a lot of the genes. And what's interesting now with the single cell resolution, you can see they're actually more enriched, even though it's, uh, we're talking about Alzheimer, but the gene signature is more enriched in the macrophages. So a lot of this, you know, phagocytosis for the plaque, uh, debris removal, those tasks are taken up more by the macrophages than only a small cell, which is MG2. Okay, so, um, and uh, maybe I'll just uh, almost done, uh, maybe just uh, uh, briefly about the intrinsic, I'm really running out of time. So the intrinsic, um, that's the opposite, right? The intrinsic, that's how I started with the, 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 the research. So we wanted to uh, understand that what are these neurons, what kind of gene program activated after injury. So, um, so uh, when I was a postdoc, we started looking at uh, the genes that are different and I showed uh, SMAT1 is one of the genes that's really important for the regeneration. So that's all talking about neuron. When we activate the, the gene using a AAV, uh, we're able to show that the axons are able to crossing the injury. So these are intrinsic. Uh, and, uh, and then recently, I'm going to just highlight one slide. And you know, we also look at the epigenetic, how the, so you remember the DNAs are wrapping around the histone. The histone has tails that can modify it by either uh, methylation, escalation, and the, the, the DNAs, the cytosines, are, it's not just ACTG, the C cytosines are methylated uh, heavily. And that's all controlled by these enzymes. So we actually spent a lot of time understanding, uh, mostly in the HVAC, but also recently TED, what they're doing for the gene program. So, um, and I wouldn't have time to talk about, basically here is a, a cartoon showing the SMAT1 collaborating with these uh, histone modifiers to open the chromatin. And once that, chromatin is open, then these regeneration associated genes are activated. Uh, so that's how we kind of approach. Uh, and finally, um, the, the most active project currently is looking at the DNA methylation. The TET3 is activated in the regeneration. And here is a, during the gene ontology, we basically find a very, very interesting uh, family. It's called a basic helix loops helix um, uh, period uh, aren't uh, sim pathway. These are the transcription factor that's heavily enriched in the um, in the areas at the genomic loci that's uh, activated after regeneration. And now, what are these? Why are we ex we're excited about this family because they are the environmental sensor that sort of relay the environmental information all the way to the nucleus. So you guys all heard about circadian rhythm. So we found the BMAL, uh, which is aren't like and clock, these are the circadian rhythm that controls the 24-hour the cycle. Most of our genes, by the way, a third of our genes are controlled by the circadian rhythm. And that's actually uh, is enriched in our regeneration program. So hopefully next time I can come back and tell you we have some preliminary data already indicating that the injury response, how the neurons respond to injury, it depends on the cycle of the circadian rhythm. Whether the injury is happening during the day and during the night, it's actually very different. And if you think about it, it's evolutionary conserved. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, so they also in, uh, they also sense hypoxia. So when the met metabolism, when you don't have angiogenesis happening, or the, the cells are hypoxic, they also respond to injury very differently when they have enough nutrient. And finally, uh, something called AHR, which is also this family. They even sense environmental pollutant, but we actually don't think it's you know that's not evolution, but somehow they uh, they they sense the nutrient tryptophan concentration in the environment. Okay, so the uh, so I'm not going to talk. Hopefully, next time I will talk to you about some of these cancer program that we're also looking at the corralling, uh, the same thing corralling cancer like the wound that doesn't heal, uh, and um, we're looking at the how the mechanical the cell bow, uh, the cell um, mechanics that control the invasion, and finally the I mentioned the the plexin B. It's a it's, it's a homolog. It's a plexin B1, not B2. Although B2 is also implicating Alzheimer. So we're working with Bain's group. We're generating, we already generated the knockout mice uh, with the Alzheimer model. And uh, hopefully we can update you uh, soon. And here is the people who actually did all the work. Uh, thank you. Wow. Jenny, that's just unbelievable. It's more exciting every time you speak to us. 
Uh, I can sense your passion and uh, excitement. It's almost more than you can, uh, more than one can bear. Uh, does do you, just a really simple-minded question? It's, my mind is simple. Uh, do you think that the 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 observation that the um, the HDAC and the tamoxifen is really effective during that first week, and it doesn't really matter so much later on, has any clinical implications for spinal cord treatment yeah. uh, in the early versus the late phases? Yeah, that's what we're hoping to um, to show um, the you know this this corralling, uh, the if you you know treatment along that kind of line has to be done early. Uh, and, and in fact, I didn't mention that. In fact, the, if you uh, delete the gene uh, later, it's actually better. So, so there is a window for sure. So, the if you you know just uh, if you if you do the conditional knockout uh, at the early time, they, these mice actually re recover even better than the control. So that that meaning that later on you let them um, recover, it's actually better. So it's it, there is definitely a timing. So uh, we actually there is a company that actually has a uh, anti semaphore d a monoclonal antibody that they developed uh, currently using for the used for the uh, solid tumor so they actually contacted us so we're actually doing some experiment to to see whether we that can be translated into uh, uh, using the uh, uh, function blocking antibody to see in the in the spinal cord injury and also in the gbm amazing Chris? I was going to ask kind of a similar question. I was wondering if you could give us some idea of your uh, plans for a translation to treatment. Yeah. Um, so the uh, um, so the plexin is a difficult uh, <coughs> tar drug target uh, because it's the uh, uh, the uh, because of the, the domain which I didn't really <coughs> have time to talk about. It is a, it's a very big molecule. And, uh, uh, and there is a recent paper uh, for your vascular interest that uh, people actually show the plexin D1, so D and the dog D1 is a mechanical sensor on the endothelial cell in the aorta. So when the blood flows, the, 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 the plexin actually has a ring that can close and open a floppy kind of. So that's how the blood flows, the, the ring kind of collapse and that triggers the downstream activation. So, um, and, and they showed that uh, the, the, and then the endothelial cell, when the blood flows with this plexin sensing the blood flow, and that can actually, uh, you know, somehow controls um, the mechanical response and, and subsequently lipid um, deposit in the you know, vascular disease and all that. So, so, so there are these, uh, uh, I'm actually collaborating with Bing to see whether we can, pharmacology group here, to see whether we can find the, um, the domain that you can target of that floppy hinge you know, so, so we have to kind of go into detail to figure yeah. out how do you target this. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.